Welcome to the Swim Swam podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges, and joining me today is Russell Mark, USA Swimming National Team High Performance Director. Manager. Manager. First. <laughs> um, Russell, how's it going? Doing great. Cue the music. USA Swimming meet you go to that that is a high level where there are elite athletes at. Uh, Russell is always there talking to all of them um, at the at the little table by the warm down pool where there's all the computers and uh, he's reviewing technique. He's reviewing strokes with with the whole entire national team, junior national team. Um, he's basically the rocket scientist of swimming and. Uh, and I'm looking at your Twitter right now, and it says you're an ex-rocket scientist. Um, how, so my first question was going to be, how did you get into this position with USA Swimming? And I think ex-rocket scientist is probably a good starting, launching, good launching point. Well, yeah, thanks for that intro. I think it's a, it's a funny summary, but I, I do love that. It's, it is pretty hilarious to have been an actual rocket scientist. Um, I graduated from the University of Virginia with an aerospace engineering degree, and I thought that that's what I would be doing as my career. I initially went into that as my career. I went right from school. I went and worked at Pratt & Whitney when they build and design aircraft engines. So I was working on the military, experimental military jet engine program and doing design work, structure work. I didn't get too deep into it because I was only there for nine months before I came to USA Swimming. And my journey in USA Swimming has been an amazing one. I mean, after that short time at Pratt & Whitney, I took an internship that I just applied to on a whim. And I went from making like $60,000, $65,000 a year right out of school down to like about six dollars and fifty cents <laughs> and i don't think my well i know my parents weren't very happy about that career choice um but it was only supposed to last a year it was really just for me it was a dream come true and i thought i would see where it goes and lo and behold it's been 18 years now <laughs> and it was yeah it was supposed to be a one-year internship i was getting paid a thousand dollars a month and I feel I felt so fortunate for that. And now to have been to made a, a career at a dream career out of this, I feel even luckier every single day. Uh, so so let's back it up a little bit. Did do you have swimming roots? Did you swim at UVA? Did you swim in high school? Uh, oh, yeah. What's the story there? Yeah, I swam for the Flushing YMCA in New York City, and we were a small YMCA team. And I loved it. And I chose my school based on academics. Um, and so I went to UVA. I was not good enough for the team. I knew that. And, but I had hopes of walking on. And at the time, that was Mark Bernino when he was there. And justifiably so on his part, he did not let me swim my first year there. Mm -hmm. My second year, I, or in between the, the summer of my first and second year, I trained with my club team to try to get better, try to make, I mean, just to put in perspective, I didn't even have a junior, junior cut. And that's what Dino wanted at the time. And obviously the UVA team has gotten so good um, since then. And they were really good back then too. They were still perennial top 15, top 10 team. And Dino did not let me swim my initially and uh somehow he gave me a chance i am not really sure how it happened i think he was also a little bit surprised to see me show up at a team meeting one day and uh that relationship thankfully to him lasted he didn't really talk to me my entire first year swimming for him which was my second year at school um but i was the worker i would be lucky if i scored maybe two points ever 
for a UVA dual meet. And, um, but I was kind of the team mascot, kind of the, I was the hard worker. I was that guy. And um, so, so thankful for that experience or for what Dino gave me. That was the start of the UVA men's like long streak of winning ACCs. And yeah, so my second year there, my first year swimming on the team, that was the start of winning three in a row and, and onto whatever, I mean, however many they ended up winning in a row. Um, that was the start of it in 2000, or sorry, 1998, I think it was. Or 99 season, I think. So we won 99, 2000, 2001. I graduated 2001. Gotcha. Uh, so, so did you ever score two points at the conference level? No, ne- definitely never at the conference level. Okay. Maybe at the dual meet level. I think okay. Dino might have might have put me in, like, like right before we go exhibition. Uh, I was I was just happy to be there. Just like I was so happy to be at USA Swimming. Just everything that swimming has given me has been, yeah, I feel just very, very fortunate. Uh, so, so what did you, what events did you swim? Oh my gosh. I was hoping we wouldn't get into this. <laughs> um, I tried to swim brushstroke and I was there when Ed Moses was there. I was there when Gary Marshall okay. was there before he went to Stanford. Mm-hmm. Um, we had a pretty good brushstroke group and I was at the very end of it and yeah, Ed would lap me doing in breaststroke sets and I couldn't do anything. I, I was just, I mean, he was the best in the world at the time. And um, <laughs> that's, that's where I was like, this was the worst person on the team. And I was like down there. <laughs> um, the, I, there's absolutely no shame in that. Um, I, I'm in the same boat, you know, I just didn't, I just didn't end up swimming in college to where to the point where I would get publicly humiliated for my swimming, <laughs> um, or 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 lapped. Yeah. So so I I hear you, uh, and that's awesome. That's such a great story, especially the fact that you t- you, you like the, your first year you didn't swim and then you got a walk on spot and you were on the team. That's so cool. Yeah. No, I loved every moment on that team. And so so. Uh, I mean, this might be a big question, but you know, you you swam, you worked really, really hard to get on that team. Swam, swam on the team for three years. What what were some of your takeaways after that experience that you worked so hard to get and made happen for yourself? I I just I love the team aspect of it. I think that's what Dino was all about. That's what our team was all about. That's what swimming's all about. Everywhere, it's about you know going through this experience with people that you trust and people that are going through the same thing. I, that was awesome. I love the journey and that's, I had to because I didn't really have much that I was scoring at the end. So I was all about the journey. Yeah. You know, there were workouts, most workouts for most of my three seasons I did continuously. Like I, I didn't make any intervals. I was that guy. Um, I loved seeing excellence prepare. I loved, you know, Ed was such a technician and so detailed and he was a great teammate too. And, you know, I think it's interesting. I mean, he's obviously got a great personality too and and one that's really big, but that's, I think to see our team kind of go through that to understand that experience was, was really cool. That was my takeaway was, you know, the team experience and then seeing high, high level swimming. Yeah. So, okay, so you finish, finish your degree at UVA, you go on to be a rocket scientist for nine months, so, and you obviously have swimming roots. Um, what, so what wasn't working about being a rocket scientist or what, you said you took the USA Swimming Internship on a whim. Well, you know, how, how'd you come across it? Why'd you decide to ultimately apply and take it? Um, take, it take us through that. Well, I was... I'll be honest, I was pretty unhappy as an engineer. It was a very structured, rigid, cold environment. Honestly, like the movie Office Space, people thought that was funny. My first time seeing it, I was like, this is my life. And it really isn't that funny to me. And it just, um, that environment was, ex- was exactly opposite of, was my, of my college experience. 
And I was also an RA my, my upper class three years of college. So to have that kind of social experience constantly along with the team experience, it was really difficult in that transition. I think a lot of people go through that after college. But in the engineering experience, I really wanted to a little bit more of a engaging, warmer environment. And so I was looking for a way out. I was looking for to transition. Uh, back when, you know, 20 years ago, when the USA Swimming website was even, was, was really a mess. Um, <laughs> it just so happened that I, one day at work, I saw a posting for this internship on the front page. I don't think if it was on the front page, I would have found it. And it just happened to be there. I was underqualified for everything they were looking for. I went for it and somehow got it. I was, and really it was a phone interview. I've never really been off the East Coast and got it and told my parents and drove out to Colorado. What, what was the internship? You know, what, what, what were they looking for? Yeah, at the time it was called research assistants. So they were looking for someone with a master's degree, which I didn't have. Um, they um, were looking for someone who was going to go into coaching. And I didn't have any direct plans to do that. I, I mean, just based on those two things, I felt so fortunate to have gotten this opportunity. And the job was really helping out at the time the department that I'm in now, which is really assisting the national team and, and anything sports science related. So I, it was very different from my own personal swimming experience since I was just the worker that was grinding all the time. And um, this is now putting me into an environment where it's a lot of thought and a lot of calculation in terms of what we're doing in swimming. So I got a whole new education once I got here. Uh, so that's, that's, that's pretty funny that a, when you swam, you had no technique thought, thought of technique, <laughs> uh, and, and B, you know, it's like, I, I remember my first year of coaching, uh, which was right after high school, my first year of college when I was coaching little kids, I learned more that year about swimming than probably any other year I ever have, because I think as a kid, you don't really think of many don't think about technique and then when you have to teach it or, or you have to learn about it you're like oh <laughs> it's like so many light bulbs just go off um so your first year you you get this education and and after that first year how do you feel transformed you know what what's what's going through your head maybe what's what are your new goals at that point yeah I would say I'm still getting an education 18 years later and it's been, you know, it, it's, I've been, you know, I said this word so many times, I, I feel so fortunate to have also come in at the time when I did because there, you know, I was in intern role. I didn't have much expectations put on me. I was just there to help. And at the time there were two people in particular that, really taught me so much and that's John T. Skinner and John Walker. John Walker, I don't, oh, he does have some Missouri roots, I think, um, but I'm not sure if you guys ever connected. He unfortunately passed away a couple years ago from cancer, but he was John T.'s assistant uh, for the resident team when we had a resident team and then he became kind of the number two guy for the national team for a long time. Um, so those two guys, John T. and John Walker, taught me everything about technique about swimming and put me in a place where I could constantly learn from them. And they also gave me work tasks that, that gave me the opportunity. I mean, my first, that entire first year and probably past that, I had to basically organize our entire VHS video library. And I mean, I, in order to do that, I had to play and like, I had to watch almost every single tape and then put a label on it. And that exercise, as tedious as it was, taught me so much. And I, I feel like these, like the timing of everything worked so that I could learn and that I could kind of, you know, there was also an opportunity where I could also, you know, fill, fill uh, 
a place in swimming where people could talk about technique. And Jaunty is still way ahead of our time in terms of technique and, and where he's thinking. And I'm still learning so much from him. And so like to learn from Jaunty, to distill it and, and bring it down to a level and communicate in a way that I understand because I was learning it and then communicate to people who are, don't even have the technical base that I have, um, I think was really kind of a multi-year education. And I, you know, and I'm still perfecting how that communication works. You talk about coaching and I look at people like Eddie Reese and Ray Luz and Bob Bowman who have such a great way with words, all of our best coaches do. And so I'm, you know, taking the knowledge and the physics that I know, the video things that I absorb, and then like I'm still trying to turn it into the best language, the best tidbits. How does Eddie say what I say in three sentences in three words? And that is kind of, I would say the mastery that so many of our best coaches have is a mastery of words and communication and connection. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if our listeners are not familiar with John T. Skinner, we have, I have lots of videos with him. Every time I interact with that man, I'm amazed. If I had a yeah. one-year internship with John T., I would drop everything and take it as well. That's a good call. <laughs> uh, that guy's a genius. Um, yeah, he, he blows my mind every time I talk with him. Um, oh, yeah. So, so, so your internship ends, you, you get this great education, and then how do you end up, you know, not all internships lead, lead to jobs. Yeah. Uh, how, do you, how do you end up staying in Colorado with USA Swimming? Yeah, in the middle of my internship, we just so happened that people left the organization. And I ended up just kind of absorbing their roles too. The biomechanics director at the time, he left in the middle of my internship. Uh, we had another staff person leave. So I just ended up taking on so many of these tasks. So there was a, an opportunity and, and thankfully my work um, was able to show people that I could do a, a, a decent job and carry a load. So that is how it transitioned into a full-time spot. And again, it, it, so much of it was luck and just being in the right place when the opportunity presents itself and being in a place where I could stay as well. So that's how it turned into a full-time gig. And yeah, and even after that year, it's not enough. I mean, swimming, like, to be great at your craft, you need so many experiences, so many years. I'm mean, even just like, obviously with what you do, you need trust with people too. And that relationship and that knowledge absorption just takes so much time. And, you know, it's just, um, I feel fortunate to have given, been afforded to the opportunity to have that time and then be able to, you know, now I have, you know, this reputation and these expectations and, and now I feel f able to fill those to a degree and still trying to all the time. Yeah. So, so take us, take us, uh, take us there. Do you have a few um, stories that were kind of, you know, either aha moments for you or memorable where you've been working with athletes or your coworkers and you're like, Oh, th you know, this is, you know, your, your break, your breakthrough moments of, of learning our craft. Yeah. So actually I just dug this paper up uh, just recently. Um, I would say my thesis, if you will, it wasn't an official thesis, but you know, we always 20 years ago, we were starting to talk about the catch in freestyle, that very initial part of the stroke where you see that bent elbow, where you're, you have that early vertical forearm, you know, people use different terminology, but grabbing a hold of water early in the stroke. And, and that was the big thing. And um, Jaunty was really huge into that. And I would say like, I had a very, like I understood what it looked like, but I didn't understand how to get it done and how to teach people how to do it. And we were always looking at it from just the side view and, you know, after doing a lot of film study, I, you know, watching Grant Hackett, watching Natalie Coughlin, they, and understanding where their stroke was, also understanding that people who, who did catch-up stroke 
had a tendency to have a greater catch, like a more visible catch and trying to understand that relationship. And then there was something that clicked and I ended up writing like a 30, 40 page document to prove to Jonti and John what we were missing. And I love that. I mean, that is kind of like, you know, they weren't going to listen to a 23 year old kid who didn't have the years with as they did. So I had to write something and really, you know, take screenshots of a video and put it into this 30 page document. And, uh, and, and that was kind of the start of like, okay, I, I'm kind of understanding something now. And, um, and then probably the, the other formative technique moments for me was when John T brought Bill Boomer in to talk for, to meet with us for basically an entire week. And again, like John T's mind blowing and Bill Boomer is similarly so too. So to have these two kind of formative experiences, um, basically just set things going forward. I hadn't intended to be a technique guy, but it was my interest. And uh, fortunately there was a space for me to, to take advantage of that. Still on the technique train, um, you know, the, uh, the U.S. is known for their uh, championship meet selection format of, you know, having, especially for Olympics, you know, Olympic trials three, four weeks before the games. Um, and, you know, somehow we've mastered the double taper where we do great at trials. We do even better at the Olympics. Um, so in terms of technique, when you're at an Olympic training camp, with you know the 52 of the nation's best athletes what are you what's your role there what are you doing because obviously it's not like you can change someone's technique in a month and, and make a huge difference um, but some of these swimmers do end up having phenomenally better swims um, so so what's your role in, in a in a position like that where it's where it's training camp and you know they might be coming to you saying how's this look what do you think give me some feedback yeah. You know, it's really changed a lot over these last few years. And first, let me also say, like you said, somehow we do, we figured out how to double taper. Like it is a part of American swimming culture. And you know, look at, you know, from conference to NC2A, coaches have this, you know, practice in this double taper and we're so good at it. And, you know, whether, and I think SECs to NC2As is kind of that, that, that exact window that we typically have from trials to games. Um, so anyway, yeah, there's that, like there's a comfort level from our athletes and coaches that kind of also help make that happen. And, and then those, you know, 30 days, 35 days between trials and games are very calculated uh, from our end too, from a planning perspective. And uh, from my perspective, from a technique perspective, I, it has changed a lot over these last 20 years because over the, in recent years, probably the last decade or so, all of our national team athletes are used to feedback. They know how to take it. And yeah, they just probably went lifetime best times at trials, but people are, are looking for ways to get better. And nobody, I would say, is content with where they are and looking for those little things. Very often in camp, I mean, I, I remember back to 2016, and it wasn't that long ago, but 2016 Olympic camp, day one and get on pool deck and I'm videoing and people are asking for it and they wanna see where they are and they, wanna, they want feedback. And so it's within our culture now and I think a lot of it, is, that's why I'm constantly trying to talk to people is also to set up for when we get to that point. And, um, so that, hey, we are already working towards something. Let's continue this conversation. Even though we're just past Olympic trials and we have 30 days, let's continue that conversation to the point where, like, I mean, days, maybe even in warm up, you're like, I'm still giving feedback to athletes like Nathan Adrian or Ryan Murphy, who I do have a great and long history with. And, I, you know, and that starts from, that starts from now that starts from the entire season and multiple seasons building up to camp. And my hope and my goal is always is like to have some kind of relationship with at least the, an athlete's coach 
if I don't haven't met the athlete yet before the Olympic camp. Um, so that by the time we get to camp, it is not just, hey, for the first time, I'm Russell, this is what I do. And so, so that makes a lot of sense. I was going to ask, you know, uh, <clears throat> you and I meet a lot on the road. Uh, I'll, go, I'll go to a school for practice and pancakes. And very often, Russell will also show up before or after me uh, and, and be filming for a completely different reason, um, you know, to, to, to look at teams techniques. And it's always, it's always great <laughs> seeing you on the road. Usually, uh, it coincides with the pro swim series with USA swimming's meets. Um, but it's, but it's interesting to hear you say, you know, we start that process then and during the regular season, and then it's kind of building, building off of that process, um, you know, in, in a training camp type situation. So, so that kind of made me think, you know, again, 52 of the country's best athletes. These are, these are our top swimmers. Um, obviously they, they want to find ways to improve, but how, how far can you take someone's stroke technically? Who's already, who's already that good. Um, I mean, is that ever a problem for you? Because you're like, technically you're sound. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, you know, with stroke as it is technique, I tend to see all the good things in, in people. And I will make sure to point that out because I'm definitely not, I don't want to, I mean, these are the best swimmers in many cases of the world and sometimes history. And I, you know, I've taken my cues from the athletes a lot of times, like you see them working harder in training and they're, they're already the best. I don't know if you can hear that thunder outside. Is that loud? That's thunder. Yeah, no, I yeah. do hear it. <laughs> okay. I can close the window if that, and then you can cut. Oh, it's off. fine. Okay. Um, I, I take my cues from the athletes. They are constantly working harder in training. And they oftentimes, they're the ones that are asking for technical feedback and opportunities to get better. And oftentimes it is the best in history and the best in the world. And I am not one to try to insert myself and say, hey, Michael Phelps, you need to do this. Your stroke is terrible. And that is definitely, like I learned quickly that that's not how these athletes and coaches accept feedback. And so, I don't know, I, I, you know, you talk about how we run into each other at, at, at pool, on pool decks randomly, and you see the, I see the rapport that they have with you after all this time, and there's a trust that they have, and you know, you put in that work, people will feel more comfortable with you and ask you questions and ask you for help, and that's the same way with um, the technical side of things. And when athletes like Phelps and Ledecky and Simone and Caleb have technical things in mind and Nathan, you know, he's one of the greatest of all time and, and still looking for things, ways to get better, then that's an example for everybody. <laughs> um, is, is there... So basically what you're saying is, is if they come to me and, and want and, and ask about technical things, I'm, I'm going to give them my honest answer, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah, absolutely. Has there been a case where you, you, you're like, I, I'm not going to touch your stroke. It's perfect. <laughs> you know, I would say the most tech, you know, if there was a technical example, I, Gosh, Missy's backstroke is probably the closest to textbook that I've, like, that I look at and and just say, wow, that's that's the that's the model. Yeah. You know, besides that, I do feel like there's opportunities, and you know, those opportunities stand out because everybody fades in a race at some point, <laughs> even you know, and everyone will make a race strategy mistake, and then something will stand out technically too. So while the mistake might have been in the race, like you see a flaw that happens when someone fatigues, you see it in practice too. And so if anything, the minimum is that 
Like these are things that happen to you when you get tired. So here are things to keep in mind as you move through a race or as you get tired in practice. So that's the bare minimum. If, if someone's stroke is mostly perfect. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Is there, <clears throat> has, has there been, um, a case or a few cases that stand out to you where y- you were working with someone and then you saw that play out in a pretty big way, not saying like this was your doing, but you know, you, you, you had a collaboration and then you saw that pay off. Yeah. And I would never take credit for any, like any, what anybody's doing. I feel great internally if I see someone have success, but ultimately like, I feel like I'm playing such a small part and yeah. helping them move towards that way and not actually do anything myself. Um, I've definitely like every athlete and coach, first of all, I'm so thankful they let me in. And secondly, just that they would even consider some of these ideas um, and that they trust me. And, you know, probably the one, and, you know, there's so much, there's so many examples that are rewarding, but, you know, the one that really stands out right now that you asked about is Simone. And I am so, you know, from her journey as a high school junior teamer to making the Pan Pack team, um, that's actually starting at 2013 Worlds. So junior, 2012 yeah. Junior Pan Packs, 2013 Worlds as a relay swimmer, uh, 2014 Pan Packs in Australia, and then 2015 uh, Worlds. It's just a, it was to see that journey and to have seen how much she was willing to put in her work, she put in herself to be better. Her and her coach, Allison Beebe came up to the Olympic training center a couple times to work on her start. And now you see her start as like one of the best in the world. And that is so much Simone and Allison putting in that time and work and giving me the chance to, sh- to kind of guide them. Uh, Simone is so intuitive and so great of an athlete. And yeah, like initially her start, like we all know her start now, but it wasn't that great in 2013. And she made those changes. And to see that, uh, and then from 2015 to 2016, I've talked about this in a few presentations, but I don't know if many people know this, but like she changed the primary side that she breathed on too. And in 2015, if you watch that race at Worlds in the final, she's breathing primarily to the right side with like three or four breaths to the left. And in 2016, she, and even now, it's primarily the left side. And so like 2015 Worlds to 2016 Olympics, and it was, a, it was a collaborative effort in like, hey, this is what I'm seeing on her right breath versus her left breath. And Greg Meehan and Simone put in this plan to implement that over the entire year. And then obviously we're talking about the ultimate payoff in winning that gold medal. And it was... Incredible. And, you know, my screams for joy in that, in, in Rio were happiness for Simone. And like, none of it was like, oh, I did, I was part of this. Like, none of it was that. It was, gosh, man, like knowing the work that they did. Technically, I know the techno part, but there's so much else that went into it. And for that payoff to happen, that's, that's the ultimate. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's super interesting because I've heard of, you know, uh, changing from both side breathing to one side breathing, but why, why, why switch sides? And this is something that I've made a priority when I talk to people is just the quickness and the efficiency of the breath. And obviously everyone has to breathe in freestyle or in all swimming and how you take that breath could really be a detriment and a flaw. It's a huge flaw in freestyle. And a lot of people will take too long in that breath. And in taking too long, they'll compromise the non-breathing stroke that's in the water still. Because they're, they're so focused on the breath that, that the non-breathing arm just slides through the water or isn't as strong or doesn't have the integrity. So um, most people have a, a better side that they breathe on. And I encourage people to focus on that side for a race and then improve on it. And so that's, 
that was the thought behind kind of going towards one side versus the other is, hey, maybe your less natural side is actually technically better. And so you'll see someone like Simone, like Simone is still bilateral breathing more in a 200 when the rhythm's mm -hmm. a little bit slower and the tempo's a little bit slower. But as you get down to a quicker tempo, yeah, your breath needs to be on point so that it doesn't inhibit your propulsion and your stroke and your rhythm. It's very interesting. I think, I think Nathan is one of the most evident swimmers of someone who thinks about that. If you watch him race, it's very he, evident there. <laughs> he's the model. I mean, before him, I, you know, Phelps had a really quick breath and, you know, he swam with a slower tempo, so it wasn't as evident, but did a really great job getting his head back in line. Phelps, the people I watched initially and Bill Boomer is the one that really kind of put my eyes to this was Phelps, Natalie Coughlin, and Ian Thorpe. So good at getting their head, breath, head back in line. And then you, like this generation, Nathan has made it so evident and so prominent. And yeah, you watch him swim and it is like people marvel at it. And, and I do feel like people, yeah, love the, vid the visual examples and Nathan is a great example of that. Yeah, that's super interesting. <laughs> um, all right, so, so you were a breaststroker uh, <laughs> when you swam. As you put it, you tried to swim breaststroke. Um, is there a favorite, do you have a favorite stroke to work on mechanically? I would say it's actually fly. Um, fly because it's a challenge to me. And I think understanding it isn't as direct as backstroke or freestyle. And like freestyle and backstroke, a lot of it is you move, you press water this way and you're going to move forward and get your body in those positions for fly. It is so rhythmical. It is like, it is really hard to get a good catch, to get your arms up, to get both your arms into a good catch. Um, and so you see varying degrees, even at the top level. So I think understanding that I love the challenge and, um, you know, and we've really focused on it as a country over the last few years. And I have really appreciated just watching. I just really enjoy watching fly now. So uh, breaststroke is always one that people enjoy talking about or really don't enjoy talking about, but uh, it's so com it is complex, but I feel like I have an, a good understanding of it and fly. I feel like I'm attracted to it for the challenge. Interesting. So right now, what's your personal philosophy on butterfly? You know, if you're just, if you're ex swimmer, what do you need to do in order to, to improve your butterfly? Yeah. I, I mean, I think we need to kind of reset the narrative about the stroke and very so much. It's often about this undulating, big undulating motion, mm -hmm. uh, like in a wave form. And I really feel like we need to move towards a, most people need to move towards towards a flatter forward stroke. So a much flatter stroke that um, I think sets you up for a better pull, a better breath. Uh, I think that big motion that you see, and I think people have in mind people like Phelps or even Luca Orlando more recently, um, that doesn't necessarily work for everybody. And I would say the majority of people, like I, I really like Haley Flickinger's stroke. I really like Caleb Dressel's stroke. And yes, like, they also happen to be the best in the world. Um, but technically I think like they're better models for most people who have, I would say more normal range of motion in their shoulders than someone like Michael Phelps. Uh, and there's no, no discredit to his stroke. Obviously it's just, um, you have to try to figure out what the exceptions are that the elite do and what the elite do that everyone can do. And so, yeah, moving towards a flatter stroke, two kicks. I think a flatter stroke where you're not tucking your chin all the way um, and not driving your head all the way down to the bottom, that will set you up for the breath much better and that will set you up for your pull much better. Interesting. Do, do, what, do you, what do you think about uh, breath control and butterfly? Should you breathe every other stroke? Should you, you know, if, if you're developing a perfect fly, should you breathe every stroke like Michael did? Um, what's What's the rationale there? 
Yeah, most people, the breath, just like freestyle, the breath is a flaw and the breath will be a point of slowing down and deceleration. So I would say the focus in this, my <laughs> standard answer is work on making your breath better. Work on making your breath mechanics better and understand when you should time that breath, which is kind of, you want to be patient. So do it in the middle of your pull and um, and figure out how to stay low in that water with that and how to stay propulsive in the water. Make sure you have that kick when you breathe too. So I would say work on making your breath better and then you can breathe more. And until then, I, I would say you stick with the breathing pattern that your coach gives you because you're typically faster with the non-breath stroke. Obviously, you have to find a balance to that though. Makes sense. Uh, so of, of, you know, you go to, you, you go to every big meet there is, um, of, of non U S swimmers, um, who is someone whose technique has impressed you the most? Yeah. I mean, I would say in fly and I've, I heard Ray Luz mention this on his podcast, uh, Sarah Schoistrom, her fly, um, I think Maggie McNeil's fly is awesome. And, you know, looking at other strokes, I mean, they, the Australians are so technically good in freestyle in, as a whole. Uh, the Japanese are so good in fly and breaststroke. And, you know, you see the results, but technically also very great at kind of moving themselves forward, using their body really well. Um, you know, backstroke, US, the U.S. has always been the backstroke country. I feel like we do have the best technical backstrokers, too. Um, there's always things to learn from other people, and I'm always trying to keep an eye out for what's going on and who's doing good things and, and trying to watch video of what other people are doing and trying to learn from that, too. Uh, I think that's, you know, the mark of any – kind of elite athlete is they're always looking for things better too. And, and me too. Like it just, it's being satisfied, but then also still being hungry. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let's bring it to, to present time. How are you spending your days now? Are you just constantly researching technique and looking for ways to improve? Are you just like me and sitting on YouTube for eight hours a day, watching race videos from old Olympics and world championships? Uh, what's, what's your quarantine um, life looking like in terms of swimming? Well, anytime I get to talk about swimming, I love it. And especially in quarantine, since we're so far away from it. And I mean, I don't have any, I'm not watching. I haven't seen anybody swim live in over four months. And so, you know, I'm listening to the Swim Sam podcast. Uh, you guys have done a great job. I really appreciate what you guys do for the community and the voice you give so many of our athletes and coaches um, I have basically tried to keep in touch with people. I have started as things are starting to open up, I have started, you know, people are mentally more in a space to, I guess, digest and take in some more swimming feedback. So, um, a couple of weeks ago, we had a virtual junior team camp and, uh, connected with a few of the coaches and athletes, but then also still staying in touch with some of our national team athletes, a lot of our national team have seen this as a time to get better technically because they're not able to put in the time into the water. So it's an opportunity that when you're in the water, do it better. And so there is a whole lot more thoughtfulness and calculation going on with the time that you do have in the water, which I think is phenomenal. Um, so I've been, yeah, I've been watching a little bit of video. I spent the early part of quarantine, uh, diving into projects that I typically haven't had time to, which is we have a humongous set of data on tempo and cycles and understanding how that, I think we still have so much to learn from that. And so understanding that, and um, it was very cool, like to understand people often want to see the data from the elite. And I can't tell you definitively how that applies to an 18 and under and <laughs> So I spent time looking at our best 18 unders and what that looks like. I spent time looking at fly tempo and seeing the narrow range of fly tempo and then seeing breaststroke tempo and seeing how wide of a range of tempo is used within a race. I spent time, um, what, I'll just go on one more little, uh, tell you one more thing that I've done, which is 
like looking at some of our best now and seeing how they were, what their tempos and cycles were when they were 13, 14 years old. And granted, they were still good at the junior national level. And I don't really have video of that them earlier, but like just so interested in how this information and how people evolve because people are using more and more of this data to guide their training. And I want to have a better understanding so that I can help our greater U.S. swimming community. I mean, even though my job is technically a responsibility towards our national team and the Olympics, um, I have always felt an ob obligation and responsibility to serve our greater community. And, you know, I spent the month of May doing webinars, a webinar on every single stroke. So, um, you know, I, I see like, when I see our junior team now and our current national team athletes and how technically good they are compared to, you know, decades ago, I hope that, you know, the accessibility of my information of technique information all around is kind of helped us get better. So um, trying to put as much in, develop and put out as much information as possible. Yeah. The, uh, you mentioned tempo and I, uh, that, made me think of a, a side question. Uh, in your opinion, did Kevin Cortez break breaststroke? <laughs> <laughs> he definitely set the U S mindset in, a, in, in motion. There was such a marvel at like doing two or three cycles, you know, for an entire 200. Um, and you know, his awesome efficient pullouts into such an efficient stroke. Yeah. You know, I don't think he broke breaststroke. I think, that it, it showed people the potential in that way. On the other hand, you have someone like Chupkov from Russia, the current world record holder in 200, who's going out in like, who's starting his 200 in like a 2.4 tempo, something insane, and then coming home in like a 1.2 tempo. And, you know, effectively in both ways, like very efficient, but then also having another gear. And I think you know, Kevin showed us the potential in one on one side of it, but I think everyone needs to understand that there has to be gears in breaststroke. There has to be another tempo that you have to get to at the end because, you know, I, I've watched and Josh Prino and Madison Cox and Andrew Wilson did a great job with their Swimmers for Change episode and talking about breaststroke. And, and Prino says, like, your, your 40th stroke is – not going to carry as much velocity as your first stroke. So you need to be able to tempo up on that last 50. I do remember watching that. And I do remember thinking about mini Josh Perno 200 breaststrokes while he was saying that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because I certainly, if he doesn't embody that, I don't know who does. <laughs> um, that's super interesting. And, and again, as, as a typical swimmer, I don't know how much, you know, any any normal person is going to think about all this and so i f i find it very interesting um so lastly uh how how do you kind of see technique or, so here's my question i'd forgotten it momentarily my last question so i talked to nathan just the other day on the podcast and yeah, so I listened one, to that. so one thing he mentioned is that you know instead of lifting like super heavy He's doing lighter weight stuff. And one thing he said, he'll hold his water bottle and just hold it up here to try to get a little more stream. You know, he'll hold his water bottle above his head in a straight line to, to try to get a little more streamlined flexibility. Have you been talking to the elites about stuff like that, that they can be doing? And, um, and have you found a, a few good tricks that might work for, you know, any given swimmer? Yeah, I haven't done I would say giving people tricks. Um, you know, what I've encouraged, especially when people were out of the water, if you're really limited in your access is to watch good video and to, I think most people can just have like have better technique images in their mind and understanding. And, you know, you watch, it's so hard. Like the real swimming happens underwater and that's the view that we don't get very often. And you obviously don't naturally get it. Like you're watching from above water. And Unless you're at the ISL Vegas finale. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And <laughs> even then it's still happening so fast. And, um, you know, whereas like every other land-based sport, like you grow up watching baseball or football and you can mimic their motions 
and their movements that they're taking a, a swing or throwing a ball. And in swimming, it's so hard to have that image in your mind. So what I've been encouraging is just people, there's so much great video on YouTube and underwater video as, as well. And just encouraging people to get eyes on it and try to memorize it, try to be able to picture it when you're not watching it. And if you have that image in your mind, the next step is then translating it to you doing it. And I feel like that is the best thing. So I did, you know, early on in quarantine, I was trying to send as many national teamers kind of their greatest hits compila compilation of what they've, you know, their greatest races. And so that they could keep that image in their mind um, and just trying to do that as much as possible. That, that sounds like <laughs> national team greatest hits. I think we, I think the world needs to see that, but maybe another podcast for another time. Uh, Russell, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you taking an hour to talk to me and share your uh, technique views with the world. Yeah. Thank you so much for having these podcasts and, and, you know, educating so many people and, and what you do, like I said, what you guys do for swimming is really awesome. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thanks a lot, Russell. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.